the outcome of being successful is that you have this extra slush fund that you can commit to doing more meaningful work. And for us, that's really become a tenet of our practice. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and today I have the great pleasure of sitting down with Richard Holland and Jonathan Harvey, founders of Holland Harvey Architects. Their practice is on a mission to celebrate the everyday through design, and they are committed to high environmental and social impact standards, which has been galvanized through their recent status as a certified B corporation, which we talk a lot about in this particular episode. The studio themselves, they create extraordinary sustainable buildings and interiors across the UK and internationally. Richard's focus within the studio is creating aspirational hospitality environments. Recently, having completed Inhabit Hotel's second site at Queen's Gardens in London's Paddington, uh, alongside several other ongoing hotel refurbishment projects, Richard sees London as the world's, I like this, world's largest refurbishment project, which fuels his passion for the conservation and adaptive reuse of existing and historic buildings, breathing new life into the unloved. Jonathan studied at yay, the Bartlett uh, UCL. Uh, he also studied at Sheffield School of Architecture as well as Westminster. And during his early career, Jonathan worked with Michael and Henry Squire at Squire and Partners as well as Michaelis Boyd Associates, where he worked on a range of high-profile commercial and resi projects. During his time at university and in his early career, Jonathan found a passion for the role the architect can play in magnifying social impact, and he founded the Free Architecture, a social enterprise that facilitates pro bono design to the third sector. We'll talk a little bit about this as well. And this was really interesting because it was certainly the kind of genesis, if you like, or bits of the DNA that are now in Holland Harvey uh, were certainly created uh, here in this idea of free architecture. Um, alongside running Holland Harvey, Jonathan commits actively to the academic sphere by teaching at the University of the Creative Arts in Canterbury. So in this episode, as I mentioned, we talk a lot about becoming a B Corporation. We actually look at the economic and the business benefits of becoming a B Corporation. We look at the, the process, that we look at the kind of criteria that are assessed, we look at some of the challenges in actually becoming accredited. We also talk about the benefits of financial transparency inside of a business and how to create a profit with purpose-centered culture within your team. And we also discuss their 1% pro bono offering, of, which is one of their core values of the business. So loads of really fascinating and interesting anecdotes and stories and advice and very, very inspiring stuff um, in today's episode. So sit back, relax and enjoy Richard Holland and Jonathan Harvey. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Richard and Jonathan, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you both? Very well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Excellent. So you are the uh, co-founders of Holland Harvey. Uh, you guys are by, uh, based up in Viner Street in lovely Hackney. Um, and you've got quite an extraordinary, very interesting portfolio of work, of uh, a mixture of kind of hospitality, commercial, residential, um, a very kind of high caliber design inquiry that's gone into your projects and beautiful delivery of projects and Richard and I just before you, you came on Jonathan we're talking about uh Elan the oh. uh, <laughs> I was I was in there with my with my uh, partner a few weeks ago oh, Instagramming brilliant. ourselves and taking photographs and uh it was a a, a very uh, a very photographic space um yes. and quite actually quite a, quite a brilliant sort of uh in like branded environment uh, and Richard was saying you guys have worked with those guys on quite a number of projects. So very, very exciting client to be working with. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 an interesting one because that's that kind of we always talk about them in the context of breadth 
and being able to design design for for, for brands and design for our clients' needs. Mm-hmm. You know, it might not necessarily reflect our own personal taste necessarily, but you know, it's a that, that, there was a brief, and we feel that with that we like it is a really exciting and playful space to work in. So. You know, it's um, yeah, and, and and it's amazing how clients, even some of our clients, we show who you'd never think perhaps would 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 have an admiration for it. You know, you know, we always show we're very upfront about it because mm. it, and they're always and actually we've been really amazed at how yeah, the people clients they they're really respected brand actually, in, 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 even though there's this kind of pl- fun, playful, they're, they're, you know, they're not sensible. So it's yeah, that I think great. Really, it's, it's I pervaded that. all of our work too because. I think Alam were very much ahead of the game in seeing the opportunity that existed in social media as a means of promoting brand and building brand. And now everybody's trying to catch up. So you can have a completely different aesthetic and a completely different offering, but you still want that social media audience. You still want that level of interaction. So mm-hmm. as a case study and how you get that interaction, just some sort of baseline, you know, framework on which to build, build your space. Um, it's really valuable too. Well, it's 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 such a fascinating kind of proposition to like be designing spaces also for a virtual community or for a virtual environment, um, and kind of catering catering to that audience of like thinking about the building of how it's going to be shared amongst you know people who are having their cups of coffee in there. Yeah, it was a weird one because we I remember when in it was like twenty twenty nineteen twenty twenty and TikTok was really starting to take off and and they wanted to respond to that and so we suddenly went from the kind of two dimensional framed picture where you know you want to create you know you, you want to create not contrived places and moments with take pictures so you want to just have space which is naturally photographic but then it was that tone transitioning into naturally f- kind of working for film which is a whole different set of and that was where Elan Wardour Street kind of came out of was that idea that it was not just moments that were quite photogenic, but the entire space, which is a real challenge for a designer, because, you know, it's, you, you kind of like, you know, you want like, these kind of quiet spaces and moments where they're just kind of really nice places to sit and be and, and enjoy. It. And then and then in Land Wardle, where your entire experience is suddenly um, multi-sensory. And it, so it changed, it really changed that kind of conversation. But yeah, it's quite exciting seeing the, the development as well of social media and having to respond. Brilliant. So it's, it's that changing landscape. So, so, so tell us a little bit about how Holland Harvey came to be. Um, should I take that one, Richard? What's the story? <laughs> tell the, tell yeah. the story. Yeah. Um, so, well, Richard, you know, like, Richard and I met at university many moons ago. I think I almost get scared now. I think how many years ago it was. Um, uh, uh, but ultimately, like, yeah, we, we had our university kind of journeys. But then, out of out of out of practice, we came out of out of university. We came into a into a working environment where it was kind of post financial crisis um and the world was in a kind of a strange place it was quite hard to get a job um and we had this ambition to always kind of work together uh and so we thought that there were some quite weird things going on there were architectural competitions where there were an awful lot of uh architects doing an awful lot of work for free to, to, to win quite not particularly major commissions so there was this Example on the King's Road in Chelsea, where I was, there was a cafe that was uh, a competition for a cafe was advertised, and uh, three million pounds worth of architectural time was given to free for a commercial venture. It cost less than three million pounds to build the building, um, and we were like, something's wrong. So I guess like we were like, uh, we were like that time, and, and ultimately most of these architects are entering it knowing they're not going to win it. But I recognise that competitions are a great vehicle to create work that might get you into a new sector or meet a client. And so we were like, well, could that work be given to to social and uh, third sector clients, pr- charities or social enterprises that we will need architects? So you and they were like, could you create a place that, or a, a thing that allowed client architects to get that work, meet those people, but some social good could be done? So Rich and I tried to create this organisation called Free Architecture, mm-hmm. um, and that was kind of the first thing that w- drove us to action to work together. We kind of had this idea; we always enjoyed working together. And so yeah, Free Architecture kind of happened, and we tr- we we. we we desperately tried to get that off the ground and, and 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 create this platform that basically architects or students could basically give their free time and we would find third sector organisations to kind of plug them into and act as a bit of an intermediary uh, with a design eye and an understanding of the industry. And um, I guess yeah, that was a really difficult organisation to get, get right and we did some funding applications and, and it didn't quite work out. But in that process, we really established this kind of foundation of social impact, I suppose, mm-hmm. through architecture. Um, we also through it generated 
and projects that weren't that didn't fit free architecture but did but we, could be done and we started doing those because obviously we needed to eat and live and have and pay rent and things like that yeah. um and so i guess out of free architecture holland harvey was born um a practice that was ultimately foundations in social and, and environmental impact as it as it's grown um but ultimately yeah it was for paid projects and and, and the idea of free architecture and that the idea of giving a certain percentage of your time for free you know it was it was it was it was it was loosely modeled on uh, on an amazing organization in the us called the one percent and the idea there was that uh, that was actually run by an architect's practice that, that basically committed and actually managed to gather 470 architectural practices in the us together who all committed one percent of their time and they facilitated that those transactions so it was it was it was going on um, and we were like, okay, well, let's just focus on Holland Harvey, and then maybe one day free architecture could be something that could be brought back. I don't think the name was quite right. Um, sometimes there was a few comments about, you know, do you, are you do you undervalue the profession? And I understand that, and it wasn't really about that, but the name was perhaps provo more provocative than it needs to be. Um, well, and then, yeah, was the practice was born. Some of the criticisms that you faced around that. It was just around the name. It was kind of like, you know, architects shouldn't give their time away for free. And we're kind of like, well, yeah, that's the point. We're doing these competitions. We're already doing it. Why, you know, you know, we, we already undervalue ourselves. And it's like, well, and actually architects are famously bad at charging the right fees, you know. And, and so as a result, there is, sometimes there is this perpetual race to the bottom. And we're like, well, it's not about that. It was a name, you know, forget the name. The premise is about, you know, and so people always bought into the idea. They always so, liked the idea, although they didn't ever fully commit to it in the way so, that perhaps. So the premise was, was much more about gi like giving uh, architectural services to causes and places where it's actually needed as opposed to giving it away for free for in a commercial venture. Exactly, exactly. And like now as part of our, what we do, we've baked in, we give 1% of our time to, 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 to charities and, and we do that now. That's just baked into the way that our business model works. Um, cause we felt like in a way, what we need to do is prove that it, that we, it works and it, and it has, you know, we've, we've, and as we're through that work, it's generated new work, which is aligned with our values. So it's, it's done exactly what we said. It's just, what we realize is also running and growing a business, trying to do two at the same time is, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hard enough just making one really work really well. So I think, you know, that moment has now morphed into Holland Harvey and actually we feel like our impact, our social and environmental impact can now be much larger through the growth of Holland Harvey with this basis of, you know, so that's, things like people. That's, that's very, that's a very interesting kind of um, philosophical business structure, if you like, or ideological business structure where you know, the business is a driver for, or a catalyst of social furtherment or social be social betterment. Um, for you guys, what is what 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 are the m important things that you need to be getting right in the business side of it in order to be able to have agency elsewhere in the causes that matter for you? I think you have to be running a profitable business. You have to be commercially successful um, in order to essentially commit profit to the third sector it's not time that you're charging for um so you have to make sufficient that you can still you know profit primarily is for growing the business reinvesting in the business um, very much part of that is you know you you could sort of see it in a way as marketing you know a, a large proportion of the press that we've had in recent years has has been down to our ongoing relationship with a homeless charity called shelter from the storm uh, for who we did um this really lovely project a few years back. So arguably that that one percent investment is can be sort of perceived as marketing, but in order to have that money, you need to be running a commercially viable business. And I think often like especially around the conversations around B Corp, that um people seem to fear the word profit. Um it 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 sort of has connotations of greed. Um really the true meaning of it is just having extra money in the business beyond your operations to invest in your people, invest in your premises, invest in your processes and invest in other things for other people. And, and for us, that's that 1% commitment to the third sector. And for us, you know, um, it's that idea that profit actually facilitates purpose because without it, you just couldn't do those things. I mean, this this becomes quite an ex exciting business proposition where we're talking about profit with with purpose, um, and you know, in the architecture industry, well, in lots of different industries, yes, the word profit has been sullied, if you like, and people, like you say, kind of associate it with greed, but th that's not 
it's not what profit is for. Profit is, you know, if you're a business owner, you have a responsibility to be making sure that the business is profitable. And sure, there are corporations and things who have taken the concept and the relentless pursuit of profit without much purpose. Um, that's where we start to see a lot of imbalance occurring. But ultimately, having a having a mission-led organization where profit is at the heart of it and you've got you're using it to direct funds into things that matter. That's a, that's a, a very uplifting place to be. Definitely. And, it, and, it, and I feel, I think John and I both feel incredibly privileged to be in this position that we can work with these clients, that we can work with those organizations. And it is, it is a result of spending the last 10 years building a successful studio. And again, I think sometimes people are a bit coy about sort of, describing themselves as a success but i think it's the it, it's just a product of the outcome of being successful is that you have this extra slush fund that you can mm -hmm. commit to doing more meaningful work and for us that's really become a tenet of our practice and um something that we promote quite heavily from the outset whenever we meet a new client you know we we used to go in and pitch uh, you know, a, a portfolio of projects and it kind of felt like being like, which one do you want? You want one of these, A, B or C? But actually now we go in and we we pitch our values and we tell them, because ultimately a client's not buying a finished product. They're not going to say, oh, have that one, please. And, you know, architecture is a design process and you can never predict what's going to come out the other end when you start. Um, we take them on that journey together and, and baked into that journey for us is this uh is this approach that's through the lens of environmental and social governance, um, which attracts some clients, it puts some others off. I think it really aligns you with certain organizations and probably repels you from others, but that's yeah. absolutely okay. Because if that's you embark great. on that journey with the wrong person, you're not gonna yeah. get on anyway. It's like a toxic relationship, you know? So I think if anything, it's just a nice starting place. It's a good baseline for alignment of whether you're the right client for us and we're the right architect for you. And then you just kind of go on that journey together. And I think, I think that journey is often the point at which you bring in all sorts of unexpected players and, 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 and strategies that, you know, it kind of snowballs. And um, I think there's a few projects we've done recently where it's that layering of ideas, those collaborators bringing people in that you maybe didn't even know about at the beginning of the process. And suddenly you're like, oh my God, these guys can do this that adds so much value to, to that. Um, and that's a really exciting process as well. It's fun, um, which it should be. When you uh, start to be uh, very transparent or you start to make a declaration like that, that we're going to commit one, is it 1% of profit or 1%? 1% 1 of annual billable hours. Okay. So one, so, okay. So it's like, a, it's a time donation yeah. if you like. Right. Um, so when you, when you start, making that kind of declaration what does it mean in terms of business culture um around being transparent with numbers and operations and uh, within within your own team and even with your, with your clients i think uh, it's, a, it's a bit of we've always tried to be as transparent as we possibly can with particularly particularly internally with the team about the finances of the practice and the need for projects to be profitable for example um, so we've always invested probably beyond us beyond the size of practice that we were you know often we talk to software companies about how we do this and they're like well i think you're a bit too small to be using this software and we're like, well it's really important to us because it allows us to communicate to the team quickly like that that the the i idea that the project needs to be profitable because and then we explain why it is and, it, and it's quite an easy it's an easy it's an easy one it's like look we need to be profitable here because we need this money left over to pay for our one percent and and i think in terms of our the one percent commitment has has become i think i we've always kind of had it in there but we've never been so explicit about it until recently and now we've kind of made it very kind of you know we've written it down and said this is part of what we who we are um and I think actually by declaring that, it's actually aligned our transparency a bit better. It's like, because sometimes it's like, well, why are you being transparent? Like, almost like by being extra transparent, are you trying to hide something? You know, and we, we, we're genuinely not. And it's just like, you know, this is how the project's doing. This is why it's doing this. this, And and trying to get that balance because, you know, I think it, as designers, we all kind of want to feel like 
we're here we're doing it because we love it and that's is you know that's the prime reason that everyone in our studio is there is because they love designing things but you know and, it, and again almost like profit sometimes feels dirty in that context of our vocation it's like you know we should just do it for the love and it's like oh no we really, we've got to find, find find a balanced way to talk about you know both and it's interesting because we've met people before in the past who've come in from other practices which almost managed to take it beyond because we they, they took it so far that it became like a target driven they all know exactly the number they had hit and that, that felt too much it was like we're not you know, we're not we're not that kind of practice but mm-hmm. it was like saying like you know so yeah so our, our, our software is really good at kind of communicating that and and we take that all the way through into other areas of the practice like overtime we have a which we have an overtime are you using yourself? we're using we, we use a software called cmap right okay um and then we kind of create our own custom like dashboards which allow us to communicate the information that we want our team to see so there's kind of like the standard parts of it and we have we've created certain things like overtime so we make sure that like I know exactly how much overtime because part of B Corp, for example, is the well-being of our team and, and and how we look after them. And one aspect I think of well-being in the team is how much overtime they do. I think that's a really easy reflection of how hard they're working, what they're working too hard. Yeah. And so for us, it's like having that number constantly showing. You know, was the first thing I see when I open up CMAP to see how the studio's company is doing. It's like I see how much time overtime everyone's doing, and then I can go, oh, it's a lot. Okay, I can go into that and see who's working too many hours, and then we can have a conversation. It's like what's going on, and so yeah, and so in that, it's trying to break down a bit of the culture in architecture, which is that you know it's everyone's because a lot of practices use overtime. They bake that into their business model as a way to make money, and yeah. that's something that we strongly. Uh, it's just not the right way to to to, to, to run a business. You know, basis, basically, you're planning to exploit your team, and mm-hmm. that is wrong on on so many levels. So it's like, yeah, changing our culture, which is that, that we, you know we don't want, and and, that, and that's interesting, when, particularly when people come in from other studios and they have to get used to the idea that it's okay. No, no, we don't expect to be able to pick up a phone after eight o'clock. You know, after six o'clock in the evening when the when the office closes, we don't expect you to pick up your phone. We don't expect you to write emails on your on your weekends. Almost to the point where we're saying to people. Do not know. Trying to, you know, we want to actively discourage it. So, yeah, that's not. Yeah, you know, it's it's, but it's so yeah. It's all kind of part of that kind of, you know, the business should work, produces profit, make sure everyone knows that. Um, and 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 yeah, I think it helps. I think it encourages people to to to, to kind of yeah reject the idea that we all because it starts at university as well. I think, you know, university begins where everyone's baked in the idea that we get the same degree as everybody else. We all get a BA or a BSc, but we have to work harder for hours. We have to do more hours than anyone else does. But, you know, that's that's the way that our industry works. So it's kind of baked in from day one. You're like, this is crazy. So, we, you know, that is in, in itself. And we're trying to, you know, we're doing, we, we, we work with um, Sheffield University. They have a kind of an alternative route to uh, becoming an architect where you, after you finish your undergraduate degree, you then do a kind of a combination of working and training at the same time, which allows students to reduce their overall debt burden at the end, for example. And, and that university has a real ethos of trying to change the idea that we do, multi, you know, we, we have to do 10 options for every design to try and really, and you know, and, and, and really, you know, we have to be working all night. They really try and address that, which is nice that one university is doing it. Like, and, and, that's right. And, that's, and, that's and I'm sure the culture is now starting to change, but... That's very, that's very encouraging to hear that, that actually there's start to make these links between the over the over productivity if you like inside of a inside of a university where you're just throwing hours and hours and hours and hours to get stuff done really creates a very unhealthy business environment that really impacts people's you know way of life and your business ultimately and um, let, let's talk a little bit about the b corporation certification um what is it and and why why was this something that was important for you? Uh, so B Corporation um, started in the US, um, but essentially what it tried to create was a universal standard relating to social and environmental impact that could be, um, I guess, applied across industries. So you could be an architect, you could make ice cream, you could be an accountant, the, 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 the job, the, what your company does is kind of irrelevant. It's more having a framework for, um, number one, how you operate your business, and then number two, the impact that you have on the wider world, people and planet, essentially. Um, we felt that it was a really appropriate way of just 
galvanizing a lot of the ideas and principles and values that we already maintained as a practice. And it just became a very easy way to communicate those through literally a a stamp that appears on all of our marketing website, et cetera. And I think in that, inevitably, you become part of a network, a a part of a community of other B Corps. And it's kind of that um, acknowledgement that you all share a similar worldview, I guess. Mm -hmm. It was interesting when we started the uh, the impact assessment, which is kind of the first phase. You you, get, you create a portal online and you start filling out this pretty epic questionnaire. A lot of the stuff we were doing already, but I think what it does is it provides you with a more meaningful framework about how to formalize some of those processes and policies, um, and and then also a, a, a means of um, quantifying your your impact as a company. You know, what, what are you, what are you doing to the planet? Um, and I think as architects, we all like to believe that we are, um, you know, really promoting sustainability. It's a very dangerous and slightly overused word, but um, but actually, when you start to quantify it in the context of the work you're doing, that for us was actually the, the biggest growth opportunity in terms of getting more points. Like that's something we've now realised we really need to work hard at. But actually right. what we were doing really well, um, despite our size and despite our age, was uh, just running a, a really thoughtful organization in terms of the way that we thought about our staff, this anti-competition culture, all the, all the things that John was talking about earlier. Um, and then, you know, you go through a process of verification. So you, all of the, once you finish the questionnaire, they, they review it. And then essentially you're asked to evidence your claims so they will go through and they'll be like prove it send me this show me that um and that's quite full on because you only get a window of a few weeks in which to suddenly produce all this information so the way that we manage that we have an online sort of um in-house intranet where all of our policies and processes are uploaded anytime something new happens we're like right you need to write a page stick it up on stick it up on um uh, our, our intranet and that became essentially a really good place that we could not only post policies and processes for the first time, but we could uh, review them and refine them in the context of B Corp criteria. Because similarly, you're like, okay, we want to have a really amazing parental leave policy. And there are various online sources that you could go to, you know, there's sort of your baseline government requirements, you know, sort of your um, the legislation that defines what you need to do as an employer. And then there's, you know, best in class, which you need to be making a heck of a ton of money in order to implement. So you're like, okay, well, what are we going to do? What's appropriate for us? Um, And I think what B Corp does is it just kind of breaks those decisions down into, you know, naught to five, basically. Where are you on that scale in terms of the implementation of that policy? And it allows you to qualify yourself on that scale. And you go through that for every single thing that you do as a business. And it could be something as... Um, every day as, you know, making sure that we don't buy toxic cleaning products. Um, we have bleach free kitchen roll. Um, <laughs> we recycle our waste. We make sure that we're on a renewable only electricity tariff, you know, those sorts of real day to day things. And right. then it can step, it can extend as far as, um, you know, the governance, your articles of association, um, what is baked into the legal, uh, context in which your company operates. Um, your impact on the environment, your impact on your community, you know, so it's really like broad um, spectrum of criteria. And then you sort of, you get rated, there's five core areas and you get rated within each, you get a point, you get a score for each. So again, just a really quick way of seeing where there's room for improvement and where you're already doing things quite well. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a very, it, it was a very long and quite arduous process, but I think when you come out of the end, it's quite like cleansing. It's quite like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's given you, I, I literally have a list of, you know, of things that we're doing now. And then you can also set goals for the future because you get given a score. And then the, the premise is that in three years time, when you go to recertify, you've improved on that score. Um, so out of the impact assessment process, there were things we're like, we could be doing this, but we're not quite there yet. You know, I'd love to implement dental insurance across the practice, but we're not quite making enough money yet. But that could be a nice thing to do in three years when we're 
when our turnover is is x right so that's a really helpful thing as well is that it it allows you to plan for the future which historically we would have had no mm. you know t- tools to do so really it's like a, a, a series of very good kind of business frameworks if you like that are kind of helping you develop a lot of awareness of how you're interacting with the wider context of how you're doing business definitely and also things that you've never even thought of um or you thought you were doing really well and then you look at it against the criteria and you're like oh actually we could be doing a lot better you know we've since since becoming big corporation we've completely um uh re rehash the way in which we do uh staff reviews for example the frequency and the content of that review performance review process has changed i think significantly for the better um you know things like that which you i think as a business owner it's very easy to put on the back burner and just be like it's not important but actually it might be your staff for like i just don't have a voice i don't feel heard like and so they're leaving you're like why is everyone leaving you know and it's 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 just tightening up all the all the dials right and just and just generally um do you work with a better when you're going through the process, do you work with a consultant of any description to help you improve in certain areas? Or like, how, how do you, if, if you, if you're kind of realizing you're falling short in certain areas, are there consultants that you can reach out to from B Corp, for example, that help you improve in those areas or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, we, we didn't, um, we did it all in house because again, I think when we did the initial impact assessment, we, we hit the threshold we felt relatively with a safe margin. Um, I think if we were had done that impact assessment and we fell short, then that might be the moment that you're like, okay, I, I need to seek some advice on how to meaningfully improve on this. Um, I know there are people out there who will guide you through the process and uh, some of them may be associated with B-Lab UK, which is the, the sort of the arm of B Corp that, that looks after uh, companies in the UK. And then there will be some that you will pay for their time. Others, I'm not really sure how it works, to be honest. But we we did it all in house. I think I think what one of the one of the areas that I think perhaps we're looking at now, which was it didn't become so important at the moment, but I think in the context of our school, you know, one of the areas of the school that we felt that we could improve in most is our actually ironically our environmental impact, and that's become a real focus in the studio. And I guess we have been talking quite a lot to people who help us, I guess, um, measure our carbon. Uh, and, and and allow us to kind of start to make kind of put some numbers you know the idea of something measured is something improved use you finding a measure and whether we do that ourselves or using an external consultant just yeah so that we can really analyze the studio's impact as well as our project impact carbon wise and as a way to yeah to try and like frame our environmental impact and, and, and make that better I suppose um, and I think it's that they're the areas where we're really kind of perhaps using a more scientific approach because there's so much jargon and greenwashing out there when it comes to carbon offsetting and, you know, you know, and, and so it's, and, and, and an interesting thing about the B, but well, once we became a B Corp, we became part of the B Corp built environment working group, which has just been really good because there are both architects and other built environment consultants in there who've been B Corps a bit longer and actually are a little bit further along the journey. And actually we've, it's been a really amazing sharing environment to, to to learn so there are a couple of practices there that have been really kind in terms of talking about the way that they measure their carbon and and some of the things that they've discovered along that process you know one thing they said was that when you start measuring your carbon when you first do it you, your 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 carbon your amount of carbon you use as a company goes up over the first few years because you get better at measuring it and then mm-hmm. after that it starts to come down and that's like okay that's really interesting you know really insightful useful things to have to kind of propel you a little bit further forward than you would have been if you were just trying to do this kind of completely from a blank slate. Um, As it, so, it, yeah, it's like the use of external consultants is an interesting question because it's about trying to, because also it's investment. It costs money to start. And so it's trying to, we're trying to really see where the investment in that kind of role gets, mm. you know, the most, the most value, I suppose. And does it affect, obviously, who you're working with? Does it attract, does it help you attract the right kind of clients? Does it help you repel the wrong types of clients? Does it... <laughs> Well, I think kind of be more selective with who it is that you're yeah. going to be working with. And... I'm not sure it's repelled anyone yet, but I might be wrong no. because we wouldn't know, would we, if someone had decided <laughs> no. not to work with us. Um, I think it definitely aligns you. I don't think it attracts or repels, but I think it aligns you. I think it's a nice icebreaker. Um, we have um, been very um, uh, lucky to have 
been commissioned for some pretty high profile projects recently where it has been as a direct result of us going in and pitching values and obviously b corp is a part of that it's not like we go in and say hey we're b corp therefore x y and z it's like we believe x y and z and as part of that we use b corp as a sort of measure of of um our commitment um so but it's definitely a way to yeah you're already part of a community it aligns you with other people in that community and people who are aspire to be in that community so many companies will come to us and be like oh you know i'm on i'm, I'm already becoming i'm on my way to becoming a b corp i'm b corp pending or it's you know on my list of things to do so it's definitely there's a bit of a movement um, and i think we were lucky to get in there relatively soon there's about five or six architectural practices i think mm-hmm. some have been b corp for a long time um we're, we're late to the party in that respect, but I think you will see in the next few months and years um, a huge uptake, particularly in the architectural community, because it's just so well aligned with what we do. And I think the way that most architects see the world. How does it? I think, I think in some ways it's had, it almost had more impact on our existing clients. And I think in a way, because a lot of, when we look, when we analyze and look at the way that we create work and it, it like most, the practice has grown because we've created these very long relationships with existing clients. So they've seen us go on that journey and they've known what we've been about, but then they've seen that mark and they've, and, and they've gone, oh, that's that's really interesting. And actually some quite of our, more of our larger clients are looking into it and, we're, and they're like, and, and they're open, they're saying, well, can we, guys, can we come and talk to you about it? And it's been a really nice way to reach out and talk to our existing clients, which isn't project specific, it's say. And so it's, it's kind of like then they're like oh yeah you were about that oh but you're really about that that's really nice to know and oh but that's, let's go and let's have a chat about it because actually we're exploring it and so I, yeah I feel like and actually when you are when you when you think about what business development is about like, yeah for us existing clients either that is our work or they you know they 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 they, they breathe, you know they talk to other people in the industry and, and and our clients are always very kind in their referrals and and you know I, I think 95 98 percent of our work has grown out of work we've already done. And so it's, yeah, I think it's always about, show, you know, our clients want to see us evolve and go on a journey with them. They often grow, you know, whilst we have grown, a lot of our clients have, have quadrupled, you know, grown in, in quite significantly. You know, we were talking about Elan at the beginning and Elan has gone from one site to 20 sites. You know, they, they've really changed as an organisation, which is great. We do too. And, it, and they, I think they expect us to grow. And so it's, it feels like it's the, it was the really logical next step. Um, and and I think yeah, it's really important that that that, that, that happens. I, I can imagine uh, the B Corporation certification, as you say, is you know being very popular amongst architects. Like ideology, ideologically, it's kind of in alignment with uh, the way a lot of architects think. What about the rest of the construction industry? I think there's um, I, I think there's a lot of clients uh, who are you know developers who are um, becoming B corporations some pretty big players as well. And that's really fantastic to see because they're coming at their projects with, uh, you know, a completely different set of priorities than they may have five or 10 years ago. Um, there's definitely plenty of other consultants, you know, structural engineers and, 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 and MEP. And, you know, there's a, there's a whole host of other B corps working in, in the built environment. I think, um, it's maybe harder for much larger companies, you know, big contractors, just because of the complexity of how they're structured. B Corp relies on you being one single limited company or, or, or you know, the, the, the way, the transparency of your governance. And so if you're, if you're a company that's so big that it's fractured into lots of little uh-huh. limited companies with parent companies and group holdings and PLCs, you'd have to unpick all of that in order for one part of it to become a B corporation. And that's incredibly challenging for larger organizations. So that may be a limiting factor um, in the popularity when you get to beyond sort of consultants. Um, mm-hmm. But again, I have not being in that role myself and not being an organization of thousands of people, I, I can't really speak for that. But. How, how does it differ from some of the other types of certifications that exist at the moment for sustainability and investors in people, for example? Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, there's things like Planet Mark, um, which is, I think, much more sort of carbon focused. I think there is a bit of a um, misunderstanding that B Corp's about carbon. It's obviously a component of it, but it's definitely not what it's about. Um, 
there are there's obviously sort of international standards like ISO 14001, which is actually 14001 and 9001 are something that we are going through as a practice at the moment as well. Uh, and our conversations with them, they've very much said, well, look, if you've if you've gone through B Corp, you, you've probably got all of these things in place already. So it should be a relatively um, easy uh, certification process for you. And I think ISO is a bit more old school. It helps with things like public tenders where they want to know about your quality management system. You just say, hey, look, we're ISO 9001 and it's just, okay, done. You don't have to write yeah. you know, a 3000 word essay on how you manage quality within your practice. Um, investors in people, I, I honestly don't know. I think we're, we we chose B Corp as our, as our first sort of major um, certification and there may be others that follow it. Um, but it's it's yeah been all consuming for the last twelve months, so um, we're, we're having a bit of a breather before we delve into the next. So, so the actual process itself of getting accredited, you know, as you've started to kind of allude to, is that you know there's there's quite a lot of information that they're asking for. Um, how long did it? How long did the whole thing take? Uh, so we we probably started. It was probably about twelve months in total, from you know sitting down with John and being like, "Hey, we're going to do this. Yeah, let's crack on." Actually, filling out the impact assessment. I think we, I think we um, uh, submitted our impact assessment in April last year, and then <laughs> our verification happened in late December, and then we got certified in January. So there's sort of a, a, a quite um, busy stage at the beginning, and you're kind of really looking into the company and filling out the, the assessment then it goes very quiet because you're just in a queue and then all of a sudden the verification process kicks in and suddenly you're on calls and you're being asked for all of these pdfs and excel spreadsheets uh, i filled out the biggest excel spreadsheet i've ever seen in my life um every single project we've done the gia the fees um a, a, a 40 40 columns of questions on which project did x y and z so it, it was pretty it was pretty hardcore in terms of the data that you had to collect um but also they were very they were very good in, in guiding you through that process as b lab uk were you know they were there to support you through that because ultimately they want you to become a b corp they it's not it's not a pass or fail and if you were very close to the threshold they would support you and being like, right, okay, well, what else could we do, guys? Could you do this? Could you implement that? Um, mm -hmm. Which to me felt kind of, when we first did it, it felt like cheating. We were like halfway through, we were like, we could get some more points if we decided to do this. And it felt like cheating, but actually the line from them was like, no, it's okay. We want you to be a better company. So why would that be cheating if you suddenly decide to have a, you know, a breastfeeding policy? That's not cheating. That's just, that's good. That's really good. Do it, you know? Um, and that was quite a liberating idea that you could get really close to your certification and still be like, oh, how about we do this? How about we do that? Um, which I found actually really progressive um, rather than just like pass fail. That would have been really rubbish, I think. I think we were in a bit, we were quite, uh, speaking to other companies that have gone through it. There was, a, there was a lovely brand designer that we were working with on one of our projects. And they were, they, they'd already, they, they'd just become a big when we started working on the project with them. And we were just about to apply. And they, they took two years, of which a year of that was them preparing to submit because they were only a company of five or six people. They didn't have many policies in place. And so the stories I'm hearing is that if you don't have the policies already in place, then it take, you've, got to, you've got to write all those. Whereas I think we were fortunate that we were, you know, 25 people. We, we, we'd already developed a lot of those policies. They were written down. And so we'd done that work because we were a little bit bigger, but we weren't so big that it became onerously difficult to become the people. So I felt like maybe perhaps we were in a nice sweet spot of big enough to have the things to support the application, but not so big that the supply chains were, were very complicated and there were yeah. more and it, and it sounds it sounds as well like the, your kind of values and the, the sort of one percent philosophy was was a, a good kind of foundational step towards being aligned with the, what's needed for a B corporation. Yeah, I think it, it definitely puts you much further down the path. And uh, you know, a few organisations have spoken to us since, and they've said, "Oh, you know, how how is the B corp process?" And it's on my long list of things to do. And you're like, well, if it's on your long list, it's probably not a priority. It's probably not who you are as an organization. So maybe focus on something else. Like not every company needs to be a B Corp and that's okay. It's not like, it doesn't have to be a universal standard. It's just a demonstration of what we believe. But if it's not what you believe or you believe something different, that's perfectly okay as well. So I think, you know, it, 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 if it feels right and it feels like it aligns with what you're trying to achieve as an organization, it's definitely a good way of, um, helping you to finesse and refine who you are as an organization 
if it's if it's kind of a little bit lower down your to-do list then it's probably not the right fit you know and i think that's okay as well um, how, how does it um impact the staff members both in terms of existing staff members and actually like attracting new team members I think it's been, I think it's been really, it's been galvanizing, I think, for the studio having this B Corp certification. Um, I think because of the way we've talked and how we talk about the work and the kind of projects we've done, um, I think we've naturally attracted people of like-minded nature. I think architects also have a certain mindset also broadly, but I think certainly we've attracted the kinds of people that have that kind of slightly world view so it's been but what so even in spite of that where everyone's kind of aligned already it's 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 really just galvanized us and i think you know even down to the fact that now within our review within our staff team reviews everyone has um social environment or aims and targets and goals basically and it's really like and 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 everyone's and, and so we, we we spent a lot through it we really focused on how to, how do we get everybody to contribute to this because there's 24 25 people in the studio and they all the more we can get everybody to contribute the the more impact we can have and the more you know the, we can really kind of turbocharge the way we work so i guess b corp has actually allowed us to do that so it's kind of yeah really kind of brought that focus of where we're going together and then I think also people, I think, well, I don't know, I, I'm really proud of it. I think the studio is really proud of the fact that we are this thing. And and there are, you know, there are, I think there were about 15, 20 architects now that have it. And there are you know, thousands of architects in the UK. Yeah. And so it, it it does, it has a it has a slight uniqueness and people, you know, we we really enjoy that. And, it, and it's, and that's, I think, yeah, people are proud to be it. Um, so, in terms of staff attraction, I think, I think we've hired many people since actually so i don't think we've really seen yet the impact of it has in terms right. of our ability to attract stuff i think you know I, I guess beyond that we have had because during that process we started to you know we we were kind of coming to the conclusion about how our studio changed during covid and and the implementation of our flexible policy and, and i think actually you know it was covid where we were really thinking about who we were and what we were about generated this approach which was about staff and team driven what type of working so when we were saying well how do we want to work we just said what does the office what do you go what does what does the team want to do how do you want to work and the team said we'd like to work flexibly we want to be you know we just want to have the the, the we just want flexibility and so well, okay well that's fine you guys can choose to how it work how you work um and i think through that then adding the layer of b corp meant that we really thought about all the policies and all the things we wanted to offer the team and during that process, we'd established that. So before the B Corp certification stamp had happened, we were already writing into our um, into our job descriptions. The studio offers all these things, and a lot of them had come out of B Corp. So we'd said that we're going to do this thing X, we're going to offer X and Y and Z as part of B Corp. Okay, that's already an application. Obviously, a year goes, nine months goes by before we actually became a B Corp. But that was in our job adverts, and we were people, we were getting people coming to us saying we were really attracted by your, your, your by your flexibility. And that, I think that was most potent in the more senior positions, which are we have found historically much harder to fill, finding really good, more senior members of the team. Um, and I think that that particularly helped there because when you're, you know, as, as you grow in your career, you become, you, I think you become more aware perhaps of why it's important that your, 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 the, the company you work for treat, gives you flexibility and, and, and trusts you. And so I think, you know, it was really nice to hear people coming in and saying, you know, what, I, I hadn't really considered you guys, but I saw you other and I really resonated with the way that you seem to speak about working. And so that's why I'm here. And we're like, wow, because you're an amazing candidate. You really are. We are, Maybe we wouldn't have got you without all those things. You know, we do we do this one thing, which actually doesn't get us any B Corp points, actually, ironically, which is we have a really we have a working away from home policy. So you can work anywhere in the world, which is harder when it's. Um, the, the time back time where, where someone's perhaps in the other side of the world basically for two weeks of the year you can work anywhere in the world and that's designed to help uh, our international staff so we have people like for example who have family they, they're from Italy and they want to go and you know spend time and so they want to they, they go home they'll spend time in with their parents and they can just be there for longer they can have a you know they can so rather than just having four weeks of leave they can spend six weeks in total in that place and, and that's been really, but actually that was quite a hard policy to create because we had to talk to our insurers because we have to be insured correctly. We have to check with the tax situation. So there are these unforeseen complications. And I think right. a lot of companies have just decided, you know what, we're not going to bother. It's too complicated. And we were like, no, we're going to try and find a way to do this. And I think that's been really, 
really nice. And I think that's that's very much the spirit of B Corp. Although, I, strangely, you know, that doesn't actually, I think, get us an awful lot of points. Richard was telling Richard's kind of the expert in B Corp. So. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the flexible working does definitely do offer a flexible working policy and do support yeah. people to work from home. I mean, that's, as John said, that's something we, we were kind of forced into through COVID, but actually has become uh, a real feature of our, our workplace and a real part of our culture and is, in my mind, a hugely successful thing, um, this, this fully flexible working policy. And then the working away from home is just an extension to that. And it's something that everybody can enjoy. You can be a director, you can be a part two, you can be whoever. You get the same benefit. Um, so I'll take my two two weeks working away from home this year, I'm very excited to do so, you know, and it's actually for me, I find it really productive time because I'm, I'm abroad, but I'm somewhere quiet and I can just get on the stuff, you know, so I think it really benefits everybody. And it's that kind of like universal idea that no one's better than anyone else and everybody gets to enjoy the same things. That's a real defining part of it all as well. Has there been any internal resistance to any parts of the B Corp certification or any concerns about the, the journey? I don't think so. I mean, unless unless someone's sort of been harboring some, <laughs> like we, we 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 try and be um, as transparent as possible about it. We do, you know, every three months we sit down with the entire team and we say we kind of we call it our SOS, our state of the studio, um, mm-hmm. and we talk about what we've been doing and where we're at and where we're going and what our intentions are, and we ask for feedback um, through this online platform that I mentioned earlier. We can we run polls. So, you know, just to give an example, for the moment, we're going through a bit of a redesign with our brand identity and our website. And every time that there's an update from the graphic designer, we'll present to the studio and then we'll ask feedback from the team. So I think it's that like constant engagement with them helps them to feel part of the decision making process. And there are times when there's resistance and me and John are like, oh, this is a great idea. And we present it to the team and they're like, oh my God, this is horrible. What are you doing? And we'll, you know, that gives us the opportunity to be like, okay, let's rethink this. So um, it, 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 I haven't experienced any real resistance because I think everybody's been on the journey together, whether they were part of the company when we were not a B Corp or whether they joined when we are. Nothing's really changed. All that's changed is that we filled out the forms and we got the rubber stamp. The ethos of the company, the culture hasn't changed. That's always been there. It's just been a way to qualify um, those those things that you do. How How has it enhanced the economics of the practice? (laughs) <laughs> so, that's a very challenging question um, in the in the current economic climate um it's very hard to tell um up from down quite frankly i think i think that would be that would be something that we could probably answer in 12 24 months time when we've lived with it for a while um with uh, with inflation and interest rates the way they are it's very difficult to assess the economics of anything with any real sort of uh, uh meaningful baseline so you know we are are, are Our KPIs, if you like, are much more qualitative at this stage. They're much Mm -hmm. more to do with um, in 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 house. We kind of say, you know, is the is the work of a high quality? Is the client happy? Do the junior staff feel supported? Do the senior staff feel like the work's getting done? Are the invoices getting paid? You know, it's kind of it's that level of of assessment that goes on in terms of the benefit and the impact of the company economically you know you're getting into the the, the the pounds and the pennies we're not there yet we're too we're too new to the to the party if you like yeah. i think we were quite mindful when we were going through it though i think every time an, an, an opportunity was presented to us through the b corp framework we did evaluate it where it was like you know what if we do that that's going to take an extra you know 23 hours of somebody's time in a year that's going to reduce the productivity level that means our cost rate will go up by three percent so i think being a B Corp has made us a bit more expensive as a practice to run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, and we accepted that. Yeah. And we accepted that with knowing that we're not going to put up our fees just because we are a B Corp. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, so, so I think it's, we've gone in very carefully and really kind of in a, in a, in a precise manner, which is why certain things we just couldn't do yet as well. Like I think Richard alluded to it. There are things that we couldn't do, mm-hmm. um, but they are valued in. And, and actually we said we prioritize, for example, the 1% time, which is a, you know, built in part of the business model and it's out of profit. So it's not out of our cost rate. So it's not like, we, and it's quite hard to communicate to the client and say, look, we're not, we're not charging you this because we do this. It's actually our cost rate is this. And we, and, and it's just, and so it's, it's trying to say that we're not expensive also just because we give, we choose to give time away for free. It's that 
that's just a gen that's just because we we think that's where we invest our our profit um but obviously that cost rate has had some pounds added to it through it and so yes i think we'd hope to think that people would value it because we also talk a lot about like how we might find ways to perhaps drive environmental impact perhaps through the way we charge and actually almost identify lines within our fee pros which says would you like to and i think we're very careful about using like carbon offsetting but finding a mechanism which says you could pay an issue extra and we could and through that money we could you know we we have you know through the clients that we meet we you know there are, we have connections to say forestry projects and we could actually you know and if we could start to create a fund which allows us to pay for a forestry project maybe we could genuinely change but and, and that's a different way of charging so it's i almost imagine it about rather than necessarily being able to use the b corp logo to galvanize our brand to charge a high premium it might be that we can use it as a way to structure our fees in a way that allows money to be visibly seen going into yeah. carbon impact social impact or, 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 or i think well how you've been describing it as well just just having this extra diligence and attentiveness around where profit is is going you know, and, and having a cause to make profit just brings a culture around where you are going to be nurturing it much more instinctively because you're you're looking you're looking for it, which is a big improvement on so many different types of businesses that are really not and um, they're not paying any attention to where the profit is going. So having a conversation about where it goes and what they whether it's used for for something indulgent or used for something altruistic, it's irrelevant because they, there is no mechanisms for. Um, actually you know quantifying it and observing it so i it, i mean yeah that i mean that sounds really you know there's a there's a powerful framework there for actually investigating and and setting profit up absolutely it's interesting as well because we do have time to have because i think within the culture of architecture there is this underlying desire to do kind of competitions and i think some people look for practices who do competitions and so we will have the team will come to us sometimes and say i'd like to do this competition and and they say oh and, and we and we and we just say oh, we're, that's not the competition for us and the reason that we aren't going to that competition is because we've already invested the profit in something else and that's our social impact so it's actually been quite a nice way to just explain why we're not going to do that competition because we don't want to stifle creativity and then and then on top of that then that sometimes the stuff say oh we'll do it our evenings and weekends and we we'll say oh, no that's definitely not appropriate because you need to rest in your evenings and weekends you need to have your life and enjoy your time off so unfortunately I don't think we're going to do that and then. When the right thing comes along, you know we can then have a conversation about whether we think that fits into our current current model. So I think it's like it's really been quite a powerful method of having a really transparent conversation, and hopefully that everybody understands why we make those decisions. Love it. There was there was one thing you said earlier, Ryan, was which about your um uh the your legal as a director uh, your legal um obligation to your shareholders to make profit and that's something that is um, baked into uh, the UK Companies Act and there's this uh, really interesting campaign at the moment you may have come across called the B uh, Better Business Act uh, which is very much supported by B Corp but is not a B Corp initiative by by any stretch and basically it's the premise that there is a clause within the the, the Companies Act legislation that, that commits uh, directors to serving their shareholders purely through the lens of making profit and that they want to amend, I think it's section 172, I've just Googled it, um, to include people and planet as well. And that obviously liberates directors from that legal obligation, not just to focus on uh, making money for their shareholders, but to uh, prioritize people and planet or, or, or at least put them alongside in terms of mm. what their, their obligation is as a director. And I think that's a really powerful idea and I'd encourage anyone to, um, to Google that and look into it because I think it's, uh, a very simple but potentially um, significant change in the way that businesses operate in the UK. And absolutely, and there was there was in the in the US a few years ago as well, and there were kind of um, a similar sort of conversation begun around opening up, you know, who are the real stakeholders of the operations of a of a business, and opening that up to the wider context of you know communities and the planet and. But that's the that's the the responsibility of of a business, and a, and for a business to be sustainable in itself, it, it's got to be able to have that wider perspective on how it's interacting. Absolutely, brilliant. Well, I think that's the perfect place to conclude the conversation, Richard, Jonathan. Thank you very much uh, for in in really going in deep there with some of the kind of mechanisms behind the B Corporation and what it's been doing for your own 
your own bes- business. Really fascinating stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you for having thank us. You. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.